converting to coeducation at the same time as CMC. So there was a big transition going on all over the country. Going coeducational, um, there were many things I'm proud of that I was the inceptor for, or I had the idea for. Going coeducational was not me, it was Jack Stark, our president. We went co-ed in 1976, made that decision. But I was very blessed to have a chairman of the board by the name of John Loveless, who was very procedurally oriented. So we must have spent about a half a year deciding how we would decide. Jack uh, wanted to have a committee formed for it to evaluate going coeducational. And so a committee was formed under the chairmanship of Ned Bailey. The vice chairman was me, and I was appointed as special counsel. Ned Bailey said to me, because we were just at an impasse on the committee, is there anyone you can think of who could come and speak to us, this committee, that could perhaps convince them, because Ned and I hadn't. I was very surprised when a former law school classmate of mine, Eugene Wolver, called and said, uh, I was then dean of the law school at USC, and he said, I'd be so pleased if you would come to the California Club and have lunch with this ad hoc committee. She came to this luncheon meeting where there was three of us for the proposition, three who were undecided or four undecided, and the balance of four or five were opposed to it. And I said, well, I don't want to presume to tell Claremont Men's College what to do. He said, tell them about the importance of having men and women in the same college. When we make decisions about war or no war, about the environment, about crime, about health, men and women need to be seated at those policy-making tables. I think that is greatly enhanced if men and women are educated together and learn from each other. She left that luncheon meeting, everybody was for it. It was 100% for on that committee vote. It went to the Board of Trustees. We took that vote and the decision to go co-ed won by one vote. We got over the two-thirds by one vote. The immediate reaction to the decision among students was very favorable, very favorable. I got a little bit of cred for being the student who presented the proposition to the committee, which was passed and was then going on to the board. My peers, my friends, totally supported this. Well, I was definitely very intrigued about being one of the first women at a men's college. I thought it would be a um, great experience for going out into the working world, which I knew I wanted to do. Jill had a very prominent role with the women. Very, very prominent role. She. She took good care of us. She talked to each and every one of us. It didn't matter how quiet or shy any of us were, every one of us got Jill Stark's attention. And Jack was really so welcoming as well. I just felt like being in a men's college that had the kind of opportunities this school did with economics and political science, which is what it was known for back then, um, was the right spot for me. And so looking at the world and through that sort of Title IX lens of all of a sudden all of these new opportunities being open to us, we really had to kind of sift through which ones were feeling right and which ones weren't. What do you have to do to a campus to incorporate a whole new gender that hadn't really been prevalent on the campus before, and in particular at a residential college that uh, required a lot of thinking. Where would women be housed, under what kinds of circumstances, what sort of accommodations for their uh, arrival would we have to make in the residence halls? In one of the residence halls where we uh, housed women, there, the uh, bathrooms had long trough-like urinals, the sort of thing that looks like a horse trough, right? We couldn't take them out without tearing out the whole walls, practically. And so we just left them there. We used to laugh because the urinal would go off all the time. It was just keep flushing. So gradually, we just put our plants in the urinal. And so, Brit so we had this really nice garden going in the Benson Hall third floor urinal. Plants grew pretty well in them. It was easy to water the plants because <laughs> there was water uh, accessible in the urinals. And I still remember that and thinking at the time, you know, that was something we didn't anticipate. 
but it was a way in which the women made themselves at home in what was absolutely, clearly, a male facility, if you will. And uh, I think it demonstrated, in some respects, both their cleverness and their willing to adapt to an environment which was not entirely designed for their needs. And that was characteristic, I think, of the women who came. I ran for senior class president and I was the first woman to do so. And senior class president was considered a big deal. No woman had ever run for that position. And there were a couple of guys, including really close friends of mine, who sat me down and said, you know, Meredith, I'm not sure Claremont's ready for a woman senior class president. And I said, well, I guess we'll just have to see, won't we? <laughs> I think there were six of us all together uh, there was a runoff, I was in the runoff, and I won. So, that was that. I thought to myself as a poli-sci major, well, it'd be good for, to run for office for something, and one of the positions that I could run for was a dorm affairs council representative and, and dorm senator. And um, I did get elected, and so I ended up, because I was one of the first women here, to be one of the first women, or the first woman to be um, elected in, in a position to actually represent our dorm um, on a council where we made a lot of decisions about where the money would be spent and um, it was a really great experience. And I think the fact that the kinds of women that would show up in these early classes, as I said, were very athletic, um, very confident, uh, smart, um, and really could take a lot of ribbing and also were confident enough to be the only woman in a class and uh, hold, hold your own. And I think that really dispelled the myth that somehow the school culture was maybe going to change, and of course it didn't. And I'll take credit for part of this. We decided we would not initially change our name. Uh, because if you were going to tackle two very emotional issues at the same time, the odds of, of, of being successful were very small. The name change came about because here we had ladies uh, in a men's college. Interestingly enough, the first group who graduated and the women were very happy to have on their diplomas Claremont Men's College. Then in 1980, we changed the name and we used very much the same procedure. And the one group that voted against going, changing, changing the name to Claremont McKenna College was the enrolled women. Uh, they liked the fact that they were going to a place called Claremont Men's College. Those of us who are female did graduate with our Claremont Men's College diplomas, and we were all offered the opportunity to turn them in, and I believe to this day none of us have, because it is a badge of honor. Now the question was, how do we rename it? Who could we name it in honor of? And we came up in the executive committee of the trustees with one name. We all came with the same name and that was Donald McKenna. And we met with him and he said, look, I've planned for all that I can possibly give to CMC uh, financially on my death. You gain nothing by naming the school after me. There's no more I can do. Uh, you should name it after somebody and get money for it. And we both said to him, all of us said, no. That's not the point. We want it in honor of somebody that we really revere that deserves that honor. Donald was the first instigator, the first $20,000, a man who had been very active in the life of the college uh, before it began and why it was uh, still active. So And he loved coming to the college. He did. It was, I think, the greatest singular achievement that has existed in my tenure here. I am so very, very proud of being a part of it uh, and very proud to see what these young women are doing in the world today. It is remarkable. I, I think the, the greatest outcome of this is just the improved caliber of CMC student, and that is totally a function, totally a function of, of being co-ed. I've always liked that term, pioneers, for them, um, because they were pioneering in many respects. But pioneers also demonstrate other things, you know, an ability to grapple with very challenging circumstances 
uh, and to succeed uh, in that struggle. And I think that was really true of the women who came to CMC in those first few years in the middle 70s. It was this amazingly free time to just do what you wanted, when you wanted to, with who you wanted to, and being surrounded with smart people who felt the same way, although we didn't always agree on everything, um, was just the best memory ever. We felt like pioneers. We really did feel like pioneers. We knew we were paving the way for women afterwards. And we wanted to make sure that we did that right.